We'll just give this one more, well, well there's seven o'clock now, so um, we'll get started. I want to get started as soon as possible because I'm aware there, there will probably be some questions at the end. Um, so just to introduce um, myself, I'm Sue Haslam. I am the National Development Manager in Hockey Ireland, co-hosting tonight um, Phil Oakley, Coach Education Manager and our Office Manager um, in Hockey Ireland. So um, you're all very welcome this evening and thank you for, for registering for, for this. Um, it's great to see so, so many on the call. Um, just uh, quickly, like we aren't exactly experts in this. We um, have been involved in putting the protocol together and we've obviously been uh, trying to keep up to date with, with all the changes and all the things that have been happening um, as we go along. Um, this is not an accredited course. This is really just an information webinar on the protocols that have been released. Um, uh, there, there really isn't a, an accredited accredited course at the moment for Hockey Ireland. Um, so again, we'll, we'll update that, uh, you on that later. Really, our advice is that as club representatives, as COVID officers, you keep yourself up to date, as up to date as possible with the information uh, that is coming out. As we all know, this is these are very changing. <laughs> Everything changes very quickly at the moment. And so it's it's really, really important that, that you as club representatives keep as up to date as possible with the information. The other thing I need to say, this information is only valid really for this, this R that we're here because of those changes that, that are happen, happening rapidly. Um, so uh, you know, we're just trying to do our best, I suppose, with, with keeping you up to date. I that we do anything that you guys decide as a club or that you see from Hockey Ireland, it is, you know, superseded by the government guidelines. So first and foremost, that is your go-to. What are the government guidelines? So just here. So just some general housekeeping. Um, you know, keep your microphones muted. Uh, there's quite a lot of people on, on the webinar, so that's the reason for that. Keep your camera off. This webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with you afterwards. It will also be uploaded and sent to any of the registered COVID officers as well. The presentation will all, always um, will also be emailed to you guys in the coming days. And this is really, you know, for, for you to also use as a tool for communicating with your clubs um, and with your players in your club. And we'll touch a bit more on that later. Any questions that you have, I would ask you to wait until we have hit the question and answer section. We ask you to submit questions in advance. We will try and cover off as many of those as possible within the presentation or in that Q&A section. If there are still any you know, questions that you have, we will allow time for that at the end and you will submit those via the little chat function, which you should see um, up there. After the webinar, the you know, please get in contact with us. There are going to be questions as things change. Um, so please always feel free to email us with those questions. All the information that uh, that will come out, we will communicate via the club COVID officer. So that will be sent to the registered person within the club, but also the Hockey Ireland website is your portal for updates. The aim of today is to provide you guys with key information on the roles and responsibilities of the COVID officer of the club of players within the club as they return to hockey. We want this to be as safe as possible for everybody involved. And that's why we have put all these things in place with the advice of Sport NI, Sport Ireland and the government. 
there are kind of three tools at the moment that we have. We have the Sport Ireland e-learning module, which you can access via that link. As I say, I'll send you this presentation after. And it's a really good one to send to your players and to your parents as well in your club. It's got the very basic information from a generic sporting point of view, and it gives a nice little background for them as they return to hockey. But it is important that they also read our protocol because there are a lot of specifics there that they will need to be aware of. And that's part of the job as well of the COVID officers to communicate that to, to their club members, parents and players. The online resources, obviously, that we have created are also there as a support mechanism. We will constantly be updating those. As well as that, there's this webinar that we will record, but we also might host some other webinars as well. So by the end of this course, we want you to have an understanding of COVID-19, the symptoms, how the virus is transmitted, and the return to play protocol. Also, little tips on how to implement this within your club. So within that, there will be the COVID officer rules and responsibilities, information about the health questionnaire, the equipment on field guidelines, facilities, and the, the access to pitches. So I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because we, we all are, I'm sure, aware of these symptoms and all this information at this stage. This isn't really new to us. Um, but just to kind of highlight, as well as the symptoms that are on this slide here, which are the key recognised for, there are other symptoms. And that's just something to be aware of, um, you know, within your club, you know, do you want people turning up? to training if they have had gastrointestinal problems or things like that. So that's something to, to think about as well and to consider. You can find more information on this, uh, on the symptoms and about coronavirus using the links at the end of the presentation. Again, uh, how it's transmitted, you can find um, information on that on the official um, government websites and things like that, and we've linked those at the end. So we're a bit of a funny stage with Northern Ireland and where we are at the moment. On Monday, there were announcements made about easing of restrictions. However, we have to wait for official guidance from Sport Northern Ireland before we can make any amendments to the protocol for Northern Ireland. Therefore, the protocol in Northern Ireland is still the first protocol that we published. So we are still in non-contact training groups of up to 10, skills and tactical drills with no contact, indoor activities with less than four people who do not share a household. So we're still very restricted in Northern Ireland. That is obviously going to change with what has been updated on Monday. However, the with hockey at the moment, you're not allowed to do anything other than, than that. In the South then, we've moved on to phase three. So it's pretty much, you know, contact training, games are allowed, but social distancing is still essential outside the field of play. Um, and that's really something you need to consider um, in, your, in your clubs. The restrictions have been lifted on group sizes. No more than 200 people are allowed in the facility. And um, we'll touch on this again later. And you can now travel throughout Ireland. So these stages of reopening are not deadlines. You can take your time as a club to come up with whatever you wish, you know, as long as it's within the protocol and the guidelines. Come back at your own pace. And that is really what, what I want to highlight to you. If you jump straight into this 200 people, you know, oh, just because you can within your facility, you may not be ready for that. Do you have enough COVID officers trained? You know, do you have your, the correct procedures in place? So just they, they aren't, you know, they're not deadlines. So we'll, we'll take our time. So uh, the next stage, Vivian is going to talk to us about the things that you need to consider before returning as a club. So I'm hand over, hand over to Viv. Thanks, Sue. Um, as Sue said, I'm, my name is Vivian Clark. I'm the office manager here. 
in Hockey Ireland and I was the first one to get the job as COVID officer. So therefore, I've done a lot of courses and a lot of reading. Um, but as Sue said, none of us are experts on this. So we're all learning and things change every single day. Um, every day we think we finish the protocol, there's another change and we have to change it again. So what I'm just going to go through now is just the prior to return for clubs and and some recommendations. And we have got, to, you know, these are recommendations and guidelines. So the first thing we would say is that you should consider setting up a safety committee. Now, the reason for having a committee is that one person cannot be asked to be responsible for all of the of the um, guidelines and everything else and that have to be put in around the club. So a safety committee also, it just it just spreads the load. So all the clubs must appoint at least one COVID officer prior to return, but we but they really should be appointing a lot more than than one. Um, I mean, they're, they could be called COVID supervisors or something, but every time, because there needs to be somebody there that is actually watching all the times at each, at each training, that can't fall on one person. So we would suggest that you have one lead code, a COVID officer, COVID-19 officer, and that's the name that should get sent to your provincial branch. The branches are then sharing those those details with us, and we will use that database to communicate with you um, so that you get the, that you're getting the information firsthand from us and you're getting it very quickly and not waiting for it to come through the club. Any changes also, as we say, I go up onto our website. Clubs are also required to sign and return a COVID-19 declaration form. And this form, it, it has gone out to the onsex and it is available on, on our website. And this form basically tells us that you've looked at the protocol that you've appointed your COVID officer and that you're ready to return, that you actually have things in place and that you're prepared to go back and that you're, you, you've looked at, you've done your risk assessment and done everything else. So that's what the declaration is for. So we want those declarations with the name so that we know which clubs are ready to go. If there's any help needed, you know, obviously we're here to do that as well. Um, now, sorry, just sort of on to the next screen. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Um, Phil, prior to the return, a risk assessment is needed by the clubs. This is one that uh, Liz Nagarvi did and put up on their on uh, Twitter last night or the night before. And as you can see, now they've got a lot of space and obviously it is working around the Northern Ireland guidelines. But you can see how how simple it is for them. So what they've done is they've taken a photo, an aerial photograph, Google Maps of their pitch, they've divided it up and they have entry spaces into one entry, one exit. So you go in one way, you come out another way. So they they have this available and they know they know what they're doing. So they have their car park spaces not to be used. They have their pitch entry points, their pitch ex, exit points. And they've also got their sanitizing stations there. So everybody knows that when you're on the way in, there's a sanitizing station at every at every pitch entry so people can sanitize their hands. So this is a really good way of doing something. And it's part that the safety committee can actually put together themselves. Um, so it's an easy way of doing it. It's a one way system in operation and it's Google Maps. So quite handy. On the risk assessment, I'm just going to share my screen here for a moment. The risk assessment that is up on, on our website is okay, is, is here. Now, the thing about this risk assessment is that it is it was written when we were in phase one or phase two. So there are changes to it. It is purely a guideline and an example risk assessment. This is not, we're not saying that you need to use this one. And also you need to look at it from your own club's point of view. Um, so one of the biggest things in here is, make, is is communicating to everybody what is going on. Um, but this is, it's just a guideline template. Um, we're just saying, that use some of these, not everything will be, not everything will be valid for you, but there might be some things in there that you can, that you can have a look at. Um, so you can actually see there's, there's different things about training, goalkeeping, goalkeeping equipment, no sharing of goalkeeping equipment. These are just things that we're we're doing to try and keep everybody safe. But again, these are guidelines. Um, so I'll just actually go back into unsharing my screen there. Okay. Oops, we've lost the 
Have we lost the um, presentation, Phil? Are we? Okay, we're back now. Um, so there are the things. All of the, so all of the guidelines we're, we're, we're suggesting are all available on our website. So you can go on and find the COVID-19 page. We are actually advising a gradual return, as Sue said. Not everybody is ready to go back. Um, some schools, some clubs are based within school grounds and they there could be additional requirements there. There could be additional risk assessments. We don't we don't know yet. So it really is a matter. Each club is going to be different. There's none of there's no one size fits all on this. And the biggest thing is you need to communicate with your members. There's a personal responsibility um, here for everybody in within COVID-19 um, to stop. As, as somebody told Phil last week, if everybody wore a mask and washed their hands, it probably wouldn't have, we wouldn't, it wouldn't be all over the world. Um, so it really is, it's a personal responsibility, but you need to communicate everything that you're doing with your members so that they know what to expect when they get there. Um, and once you do that, then I think people are happy. People are dying to get back to hockey. So I think there's, there's, there should be a lot of compliance um, around this. So. I'm going to hand back over now to Phil. He's going to just take you through some of the, is it Phil or Sue, take you through the protocol? Uh, Sue, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I've forgotten the order. Uh, so. Um, there. Okay. so the next phase here, we're going to talk specifically about the COVID-19 officer role. So really the, the job of the COVID-19 officer is to oversee the public health measures right across the club. And as we've said before, there should be someone as a lead to be that point of contact, to, to be the, the, the person kind of leading this within the club, but you may have X number of COVID-19 officers, and that really is a decision for the club to make. You know, for example, some uh, the GAA, some other NGVs have said one per ten, one COVID officer per group of ten, and um, things like that. So, you know, we aren't giving you a specific number, but it needs to be someone who. Um, can watch and observe you know quite quite closely what's what's happening on the pitch at any one time this is envisaged to be a volunteer role um and you know they 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 need to monitor advise support club members to prevent the and reduce the spread of covid-19 as as we've said they should report directly to the club safety committee or the club committee and it really is the club committee's job you know to to direct this and it is their responsibility as well as being a personal responsibility on each player, coach, volunteer member. So, you know, but ultimately, you know, it should be a, a joined up approach between the committee and the COVID officer. Selecting your COVID officer, this, as we said, this person is the point of contact. For all information, they really need to have a, a very in-depth knowledge of the return to play protocols. Um, so that really is important. And you know, from seeing some of the questions come through today, you know, it was obvious that people hadn't really read the guidelines, and that's fine because you're coming to this workshop that that will help you talk through the protocol. But basically, everything that we're talking about tonight is in. The support document or in the return to play protocol and so that's a really really good point of contact for COVID officers, club committees, players and other members and parents so you know it really is a go-to document. The person should be easily identifiable and members should know what you know who their COVID officer is, what the responsibilities are. We do advise that COVID officers on the pitch wear a high vis uh, clothing, so they are easily identifiable. Um, as I've said before, that this person shouldn't be on their own, they should be supported by all management um, and club members. This is not somebody who has another specific role on the field. So it needs to be someone, as I say, who can focus on making sure that everything is being implemented, not distracted by coaching by um, playing so we wouldn't advise where we would advise where possible that it is not a player um, and vetting is currently not a requirement unless that is part of one of their other roles within the club and obviously they would need vetted but at the moment you know the advice is that, that this is just an extra person kind of standing around the pitch so we don't uh, don't need to worry about vetting at the moment 
So prior to return to play, the, the COVID officer's jobs as such are to make sure that the risk assessment and the club procedures and facilities have been updated. That's all part of that COVID safety plan. Um, and the other thing, yeah, obviously Viv has spoken to us about the risk assessment, so I don't need to go into that. And then there's the other uh, documents that again we will refer to later. So they need to make sure that the government guidelines and Hockey Ireland protocols are being implemented at all stages. They need to communicate the plan with members. And again, you can use this presentation as a means to, to do that if you wish, um, as well as that Sport Ireland course. You also need to implement the pre-assessment uh, participant health check, and Phil will touch more on that later. And there were a lot of questions in about that, so um, we'll spend a bit of time on that. Um, so day to day, the COVID officer or COVID officers need to keep up to date with what's going on at a government level, as well as the, the protocols and the plans and procedures. They need to make sure that there are the right number of COVID officer to, officers at each session, so they may be the coordinator for that. They need to make sure that everything is reported regularly to the club's committee, so they're the go-between. Um, and that there is training attendance. Um, this is a requirement for, for clubs to do with contact tracing. And I think, Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have to hold on to that um, information for six weeks. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and different clubs are going to have different ways of doing this. Really, for insurance purposes, you should always be uh, recording your training attendance, but I know that on, on the ground that, that doesn't always happen. Um, but it is really important that that is done. You know, who is turning up to the pitch at what time? What group are they in? What group are they working in? And all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, that is up to clubs to, to decide how they wish to do that. Um, make sure that all your contact details of your members are up to date. And that, again, is to do with the contact tracing element. So the COVID officer as well day to day has to promote and encourage good hygiene and so making sure that people are sanitizing their hands when they come on and off the pitch and things like that and all the basic uh, sneezing into your elbow and stuff like that. Um, they need to make sure that there is adequate signage that it's visible to all members. And an interesting one here is there's been obviously a lot of keeping to the two meters and things like that. But if you print specifics like that, you know, that might not stand the test of time if it does go down to one meter or things like that. So, you know, think about what signage you're you're putting up as well. Um, so Phil will go into a bit more about um, cleaning of equipment and things like that later, but obviously you need to make sure that handrails, door handles, um, everything is carried out. That is your job to make sure that that is done day to day. Um, and obviously, if you are based in a facility that is going to help you do that, there's that communication and it will vary from, from club to club. So ensure that the hand wash soap and your hand sanitizers are replenished. And yeah, just monitor day to day activities to ensure that social distancing is adhered to. A really helpful thing that uh, to do would maybe be to come up with like a daily checklist for your COVID officers. You know, check we've done this, we've done that, the other. So that's just a little bit of advice. Um, next slide are about well, what if something happens? So what if somebody develops a symptom at a training session? So what you need to do is you need to have a designated isolation area at your grounds. Um, obviously, outdoor hockey, this is easy enough. We, we all tend to have enough space that we could designate an area. If it's indoor, there are a few more specifics um, on, on that. Um, for example, it needs to have a hand washing area, PPE, things like that but we're mostly talking about outdoor at the moment. So yes, they need, you need to move them to a designated isolation area with all their belongings. 
you need to make sure that they maintain social distancing at all times and if necessary provide them with relevant PPE. Um, it might be a good idea and you know we're not really going to touch too much on first aid today and um, there is a document that we have supplied to you that is an update um, from the pre-hospital group in Ireland um, but you know you might need to throw them some PPE because you can't reach that, that two meters if they have um, a sim have symptoms. You need, obviously need to get them home as soon as possible, inform them to contact their GP, and then you need to report this to committee. Um, and if required, obviously you need to be able to provide all of the contact tracing documentation um, to the HSE or relevant body. If someone has developed symptoms at home, um, obviously you would, you know, they would maybe get in touch with you to say, look, I've now confirmed um, COVID, you know, I'm confirmed COVID-19, but I was at training last night <laughs> or something, you know, maybe a bit dramatic, but you know, something like that happens. So you make sure that they've contacted their GP, you report to the committee, and um, you then assist in contact tracing, should there, should it be an actual confirmed case. And you need to keep a log of personnel in isolation. So this person obviously will have to go into isolation. You need to keep a log of who is in isolation and when they get out of isolation and all the rest of it. One last thing um, on this, and something that I suppose we haven't really talked about that much, but you know, when is it actually safe for someone to return to training? not just from a spreading of the virus perspective because obviously you know that'll be um you know very clear that they need to take x amount of time away and um, until they're they're not infectious but you know there's more and more information out there now about the effects that the virus has on on people um even after they've recovered as such and um, so so that's just something to be aware of as well that you know if someone goes back to training too quickly that could be a bit uh, detrimental to their health. So um, that's just something else to consider. Uh, Phil, Viv, anything else within that role? Um, I, I would just say that um, your GP's advice will, will trump anything that everyone else will do. So if a player feels that they're ready to come back to training, um, they're going to need to have their GP's approval before they do. And it's something that you may seek um for a player returning that they have medical approval that they can train again um simply because the, the testing will go through their gp and then their gp informs them so that it's just worth keeping that in mind okay phil uh, over to you thanks sue um so we've a lot of questions in about the health questionnaire um, the key thing here is this is a sample we're providing it doesn't have to be exactly like this and clubs can um, adjust this to their own needs so you may you might decide that obviously at the high performance level we will use something like this where the players are being checked before they get on the pitch so the the temperature recording is important if your members can do it that's fantastic if your members can't do it then you can you can remove the temperature check um, and just follow everything else, okay? So what we're looking for is that this document will be emailed to the CVO, to your COVID-19 officer, two hours before training. The reason we're looking for two hours is because if they send it in the morning and they're not training until six o'clock and they develop a symptom in the meantime, um, and they may not have reported or they, may, they say, oh, I must give the CVO a ring and they haven't quite gotten around to it. Um, that's why we're looking for it in the, in the two hours. It will create a little bit of um, a little bit of work for the CVO initially, um, but if you have any of the symptoms of COVID-19, so if any of these boxes are a, a no, then you're not sending this to the CVO. So the CVO is only receiving this if it's four yeses and if you sign the document. It's also worth noting we've added a bit since the, since um, we moved out of phase two, just to say that if you develop any symptoms, you will inform the CVO. So this is a once-off document that you send in at the start, and then um, subsequently, if you develop anything that's in the document, you inform the CVO and you seek medical advice. So that's what we're, we're looking to do. You may have a different format of this, or you may have some, a, a medical per personnel within your organization who suggested a slightly different version of this. That's absolutely fine. 
as and and we can't enforce this. We can't say you have to do it. It's a it's just good advice. Um, and when we looked at the other NGBs like the GA and the IRFU and a few others, they're all going to do something similar to this. So it just makes common sense that we would do a health check before player or before a volunteer, I might add. So it, it can be your coach would probably need to fill this out, your team manager, um, even down to, down to your COVID supervisors, it would be a good idea for them to initially get, get hold of this form. Um, and ideally, uh, well, we would insist on them being emailed uh, rather than handed across for obvious reasons. Um, there are apps being developed and we've had quite a few um, companies who've, or people who have contacted us to say, look, I have this app and you, you, you click in and you can fill in the form online and stuff like that. Now, we obviously can't promote one over the other because two or three of them are coming from within the hockey community. But the advice we've given is for them to contact clubs directly uh, if they want to uh, through your websites. So you may get um, some offers of various apps um, that might allow you to do this and that's absolutely fine as well it's whatever works for your club and, and that's the most important thing some of the bigger clubs um, with 400 kids in their system um, this could be a bit of a man undertaking and that, that's one of the reasons that we're suggesting this gradual return to, to hockey to make sure your systems don't get stretched um, so that, that's the basics on that form so if you want to move on so just a couple of things on facilities, and obviously this is a, a, one of the key parts. So Viv has mentioned on the, um, the about the hand sanitizers and making sure they're topped up. Players should probably have their own anyway. Um, the, the, the little small bottles and disinfect their hands, getting getting out of the car and that sort of stuff. But obviously you will have the stations installed outside your entry entries to the pitch. And um, you saw where this Garvey had them. They had one uh, on each of their entries to the pitch, which which was uh, which is a really good idea because it covers off everybody. And um, so that's something you need to consider, as well as the signage to make sure that uh, people can see it on the way in and things like that. Again, every club will be different. Some of you will be in a school, and there might be an agreement with the school as to how exactly that works. Just make sure that they they are in place before you you set foot in the pitch. Um, if you have a defibrillator that's inside your building, so some of the clubhouses uh, across the country do have defibrillators maybe in the hallway, um, uh, we, so they may need to be moved if you're going to keep the clubhouse locked, um, or if you're going to keep that open, obviously they won't need to be moved, but just inform your members if you are going to move any of them. Uh, for the moment we're saying you should remove rubbish bins, and that's to just avoid any chance of contamination from one person to another. And so any rubbish that's brought should just be taken home again. And you're asking players really to bring the minimum amount of equipment. Um, like I would avoid big, huge stick bags. Just bring your stick and your shin guards and your playing gear and down you go and play. And, and then once you're down there, we're looking for uh, a designated area where the player will very much be on their own and with their own equipment. Um, we talk about a bit more about that um, as we go. Uh, parents and spectators need to be informed of, of what's happening and like we don't want parents on the pitch um i'll talk about the numbers in a second but parents should like remain in the car park if they're if they're waiting for their child and when their child comes back off the pitch then they get in the car and they go home um and when we open up for matches we haven't really looked at exactly how that's going to work um there's a lot of suggestion that matches will be played behind closed doors which may well happen and um, because there are contact tracing issues with if you have 100 spectators in your ground watching a game how are we going to register them all and make sure that um, if something does happen that we have a contact tracing a, a way to, to trace everybody so that's a consideration that we haven't done yet uh, a lot of it is because we, we, we aren't in in match in, in a part of the season where we're going to be playing matches. Um, so I suspect as we move into phase four and, and step four for Northern Ireland, this will become uh, more of an issue for us. So we will advise them. Um, clubhouses for the moment we're advising should stay shut um, and you change at home and, and then go home to change again and have your shower. Um, but if you can keep your toilets clean and you have a way to manage them, then you should keep your toilets open ideally. Okay, and again, as long as you're telling the players what will be open and what's available to them when they arrive, there shouldn't be any problems. So, Sue, if you want to move on again. Um, so, just some easy bits about pitch access. Um, we want slots to be booked for obvious reasons. So, if we know the first team are training at six o'clock, 
um, and the second team are training at eight o'clock, then if anything does happen, we'll know who to contact as, as well as you will obviously have the records that you're keeping. Um, social distancing is still in place. So on the pitch, it's not. So you can do your contact training. And then as soon as you're off the pitch, you're back to the two meters. Um, so it's worth just noting, no sort of hanging around outside the, the gates of the pitch, uh, having a chat or anything like that. Just get them on the pitch, get their training session done, and then get them home again. Um, and again, the CBO would be, that's something the CBO would keep an eye on. So if players are starting to gather around, around the pitch, we just move them on. Um, and one thing to manage will be whether, if there's a group on the pitch already and they're coming off, that the group waiting to come on should wait in the car park observing social distancing. So just some of the changes we've had. So the government in the Republic have announced that we can now put up to 200 people in an outdoor venue. So we were just following government guidelines and saying a maximum of 200 inside your club facility, obviously not in the clubhouse, uh, but in the outskirts of your, in the outdoor areas of your facility. Um, again, we would advise a gradual return to that sort of a number um, I know there's not a lot of kids hockey going on at the moment, and we do see we do see in September, October, you, you could have 150 kids in the pitch and more in some cases. So this would be a good time to kind of see what works for you. And then by the time we come back in September, you can increase those numbers. And as I said, contact training and games are, are good to go. And so you can run your training sessions pretty much as normal. And as, as once you leave the field of play, you're back to social distancing. For the North, for Northern Ireland, um, as Sue said, there were some announcements made earlier on in the week, and we're just waiting for Sport Northern Ireland to confirm exactly what that's going to mean for team sports. So we're, we're, waiting, on, um, we're waiting on that to come through. So for the moment, the current guidelines are still groups of, of uh, maximum groups of 30 on the pitch in three groups of 10. That includes uh, volunteers and, and coaching personnel. Um, you're going to keep them in a third of the pitch. Uh, and again, as I said, those group sizes will include coaches and everyone is going to be phys uh, observing physical distancing for the moment. We do expect that to change within the next few days. And when it does, we'll update the protocol and, and get it out there so that we, you'll know the differences. Turn it on, Sue. Uh, just a couple of things on equipment. So coaches can plan their sessions maybe to try and use minimal amount of equipment would be, would be a good start. Um, and only they should have access to the equipment. Once they've got the, the stuff out and they've got their session set up, we would, we'd encourage them to disinfect their hands. Um, the current protocol talks about gloves. Um, and we, we received advice last week that that should change. So we will be updating the protocol to say that um, a PP is sort of the last resort. So you're better off just to get them out with your hands, then disinfect your hands and take your session. Uh, we only want players touching their own equipment. So when the players come down, we keep them out of the dugouts because obviously there's a risk that you might get some cross contamination. So really what we want is that they have a little designated area where they bring their stuff and they put it down and they go off and they train. Um, no, please don't take off your shin guards. So we, that's another thing the CBO is going to be looking out for, that players aren't taking out shin guards and throwing them onto the side of the pitch, and then someone else has to move them. And that will go the same as, as mouth guards. A lot of the time you see players popping in and out of mouth guards, sticking them in their socks or into their pockets or whatever it is. Just keep them in their mouth for the session if we can, because um, it's obviously safer. For the moment, we're avoiding using bibs um, because it brings players into unnecessary close contact where I'm, ta I'm taking a bib from a coach and then the bib has to go back and I've touched the bib and my sweat's on the bib or whatever. So just ask players maybe to bring um, two different colored shirts. You're going to th have to think about how that might work. Um, if you were doing this with kids, maybe you don't want them changing shirts, so you just plan your session accordingly. Um, all coaching equipment should be disinfected before and after use, okay, so that, that's fairly standard. How you're going to do that needs to be planned for, so it might be that you have a bottle of spray bleach or a, a bottle of disinfectant and you spray all the equipment, or it could be that the coach washes all of the, the, all of the equipment before putting everything back in the bag. That's something for each club to manage and each club will have a different access to different things. Goalies should only train if they have their own designated kit or their own kit. So if your goalie is going to train and it's communal kit that the club use, 
just designated to one keeper. It might mean that some keepers can't train for a couple of weeks or for a month or so. Uh, and if that is the case, that is the case. But one set of goalie gear per, per keeper for the moment and then wash it afterwards. So we, we disinfect in the same way we would coaching equipment. And for the coach, really, they should be the only one to move field equipment. So if you need to move a goal, um or a corner flag or something like that it should just start to be done by the coach and then that gets disinfected at the end of the session so players really we don't want the players all handling the goal and then someone else touches the goal and it becomes an issue for us so just the coach can move it or a designated person can move it and then it gets disinfected at the end Um, so just some guidance around penalty corners. So as training is as normal in uh, the Republic of Ireland, you can train your corners as you could. Obviously in phase two, you couldn't because of social distancing guidelines. Um, we need to be careful about things like masks. So probably when we get back to playing every single defender that is defending in penalty corners, and in some teams that can be up to eight players, you're going to have to have your own mask. Um, and probably you're going to have to have it marked in such a way that uh, you're going to know which is your mask. So that's something you're going to need to bear in mind for the season ahead. And currently in Northern Ireland, um, because of social distancing, we're saying no penalty corners um, because it'll bring players in close proximity to, to each other. Okay, Obviously, you can practice penalty corner uh, techniques and skills in isolation, but uh, no full corners and no defensive corners, please. Um, and as we say, good hygiene, should, good hand hygiene should be practiced before and after each session um, going on and off the field. Uh, so I'll keep going here, Sue, I may as well. I know this is your slide, but um, just further information here, as Sue said, you'll get all of this will be emailed out so you'll be able to access all of the links. And that's pretty much all the standard stuff for both Northern Ireland and for the Republic. Okay, um, we're going to move on now to the question section. So I'll, I'll put up the questions as we go here and then afterwards we'll, we'll kind of open the, the floor out to any questions in the messaging chat over um i hope you can all see that it's like a little message bubble over there so um maybe just wait i might actually just put up all the questions now so that you can see what is going to be covered and you can then have a think about whether that it's in um with maybe a question you've asked before and apologies if we we haven't covered off some of the pre-submitted questions again just maybe pop it into the the chat after if we still haven't covered it off at the end of this so um, I'll kick this off here. And just gonna... So is the Sport Ireland pre-COVID-19 course sufficient for your COVID-19 officers? So I'll just answer this one quickly. Uh, it's it's a good it's a good course for them to do. Yes, I would encourage players and coaches and uh, all COVID officers to do that. But it you know doesn't accredit you or is not sufficient because. You need to keep yourself up to date um, with the protocol, with everything that's going off, going on at uh, government level. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Okay, Viv, um, do you have anything to add there? No, I think it's just. I mean, it's it's a good course to do. Um, there's lots of courses out there. A lot of the accredited courses that you'll see are not specific to sport. It's very hard to find anything that's specific to sport. So they'll talk about social distancing in an office is not good not really any good um it's really just making sure that you have the information i think that's the most important thing is to is to arm yourself and there's lots of it out there so um just go on and have a look you can spend a couple of hours and you'll your your brain will be fried with the amount of information but there is a lot of information out there and we'd encourage you to read a lot of it Okay, and the next question, is there any information for travelling to matches? I suppose this links in, I've doubled myself up here, I've just realised. Question five is, you know, there are a lot of questions coming in about competition. So, Phil, I will let you take that one, if that's okay. Yeah, basically, um, we're subject to government guidelines. So, if we were starting matches tomorrow, our current government guidelines are that you uh, maintain social distancing of two meters with the exception of people from your own household so therefore if you're traveling to matches uh, you would observe those guidelines which would mean that you're 
if you're traveling with your brother or something, that's fine. You can travel in the car, but you're not to travel with someone that's uh, outside of your household. So if you had 16 players who weren't sharing a room, all 16 are going to have to travel independently to a game. Now, that may change between now and the first match of the season, but that's where it currently is. And we're we're no matter what we do, the government guidelines will always come first. So uh, on things like travel and social distancing, they trump anything we can say. So that, that's where we are. Um, we will try our best to standardize as much as we can. I'm just going to keep going on question five, Sue, um, across, across clubs, but bearing in mind that like clubs have different grounds. Some, some clubs have stands, some clubs have very little space. All of that will need to be taken in. Um, some clubs are based in schools. Um, and I know that there's a question in about schools as well. And we also haven't really thought about that. If you were to have a game and contact tracing was still required, and you have 50 supporters in there, how would we register all of those 50 supporters? And then if there's an issue from one of the supporters, do we then have to go to the AHSC with um, contact tracing information? So there's still a lot of there to be decided, and I'm guessing that it will become clearer as we go. Um, but just to, just to answer the travel question, basically we're subject to government guidelines. Okay, um, so number three, Vivian, I will let you answer this one. Will funding be made available to hockey clubs to ease the financial burden of these new procedures? Um, and, you know, will we be sourcing funding from government bodies? We have re we have put in um, we have a review that's due tomorrow, and we have put in requests for funding. There is funding, as we all know, available. Um, a lot of it's already gone. So yes, we we will be applying for funding from the government. So it depends on what they say. We as soon as we know, we will obviously communicate to clubs. Um, but at this stage, we're just waiting to see what what's what's available. The change in government hasn't helped, and it's probably going to slow things down a little bit. Um, so that as soon as we have any information, we'll actually get it out to the clubs. Um, will there be separate guidance for schools, Phil? Um, currently, the schools will be at the, the under the guidance of the government uh, guidelines. Um, this, the information in this, uh, will apply in the most part to what the schools are trying to do. But they may have some slightly different directives around whether they need a CVO or whether a teacher can can fill in that role. Um, so we, it remains to be seen exactly what will need to be done for the schools. I suspect it's going to have to be a conversation between Sports Ireland, uh, Sport Northern Ireland and the governing bodies for the schools to make sure it can happen. Um, some schools, depending on access routes with, in relation to clubs, will be able to open up and allow clubs to play. Other schools might have difficulties doing that, and that, that needs to be factored in in your plans coming back. Um, but as soon as we have an update on schools, we will let uh, the hockey community know. I think it's worth saying as well, you know, try if your club is based in a school, you know, do try and get in touch with them as soon as possible to see what they're thinking because you know each different school will will have a different different things as Phil was saying. So um with regards to facility updates and access to showers and toilets, sorry Phil, um, I'm gonna throw this one back on you. Like obviously we have to wait for, for government guidelines, but um you know, is that the kind of answer to that question as well? Because at the moment it's toilets, isn't it? Um, from that yeah, it, at the moment it's toilets, provided they can they can be uh, kept clean and, and sanitised. Um, again, this is government guidance we're waiting for. Um, once it's suggested that um, a club can manage their system properly and that uh, we can access showers and toilets safely, then that will be allowed. So again, it, it's just a bit of waiting for us until we get that confirmation. We also need to remember that outside the pitch, there's still that two meter social distance that needs to be kept. So, um, and that's one of the things even within within facilities. So while on the pitch, it's fine. Once you step outside the pitch, there's got to be two meters. So that has to be kept as well. So that needs to be kept in, in mind before opening up any facilities that whether you can actually do that with a with social distancing in mind, even with the toilets and making sure that there's not five or six kids all in the toilets together. 
Um, Viv, uh, insurance considerations, obviously that comes into that risk assessment kind of realm as well. Do people need to, do companies need to check with their insurance companies that, you know, they've put everything in place to make sure their insurance is valid? I think they should, because really, I mean, we've checked with our insurance company and our, the guidelines from our insurance company is that if we are following government guidelines, then the then our insurance policy will be valid. So it really is. It's down to government guidelines. So we you know we have our guidelines, but it's down to government guidelines and government. Um, so if you if you are following what the recommendations or the guidelines from the government, then then you should be OK. But it, it's no harm, you know, as with anything to put a call in to your insurance company and say, look, we're considering going back to going back to training. They may ask for a risk assessment. Um, some will, some won't. But they may ask you, have, you know, what you have in place. But once I, th I think it is, it is definitely worth a phone call. The other thing, Phil, maybe you can touch on this, but we, we haven't really covered much about indoor hockey at the moment. Um, you know, is there are there plans to include that in our protocols going forward? Uh, there will be. Um, we again, it's not something that was a priority for us, so it's not something that we we have considered. Um, but in we will do so for the the next update on the protocol based on the government advice for indoor. Okay, so I'm going to pop over to the little chat uh, here to see what questions we've had in. So the first question in was around COVID officer, supervisor for the youth section. Do they need to be guard vetted? Vivian, do you want to touch on that one? Currently, the advice is that if it's just they're going to be a COVID officer and they're not covering any other role within the club, then they don't need to be guard vetted. So, I mean, you could have a parent or something like that doing that job, so they don't need to be guard vetted. Um, and that's which is great because it means that you, you're not having to look for somebody who's already vetted. So that's the that's the advice at the moment. If they obviously if they um, if they have another role within the within as a coach or something within the club, then then that's you know that's where that comes in so you will need to have them guard about it but no at the moment no and second question here how does someone register as a COVID-19 officer for their club they register with their provincial organization is the answer there the the form for that Viv, is it up, it's up on our website is it it is yeah yeah, so well, there's actually there. all you need to do is is I think some of the the, the branches have different have different um, have different methods of actually asking for this information. It's going back to the branch. So the the declaration form that the club is actually ready to go that that's up on our website, but the COVID officer just needs to be and I think there is actually room for the COVID officer on that. So if that's completed and sent back to the branch, um, but some I know. Leinster, for instance, have a Google Doc. Uh, different branches will have different methods of collecting the information. So it should be available on your branch website. Um, even down to an email to say this is a, this is our COVID officer, um, our contact, and this is how you contact them. Uh, the declaration form is on the website um, and is part of the information that was sent out in the last protocol. Um, there's a question in here which we kind of covered earlier, but um, I suppose they just want reiteration on it. Um, the COVID officer, we are saying it is advisable that it is not a coach or a player. So, do you want to explain a wee bit more about that? Um, why, why we're kind of saying that? And you know, what about small clubs who might struggle to have a COVID officer at each session or match? Yeah, it, it won't just apply to small clubs; it'll apply to big clubs too. Having COVID officers isn't an ideal situation and it's going to make life difficult. Um, but coronavirus is making life difficult as it is. And it's just something that we need to like. It can be a parent that you have trained up or it can be, you know, a club member who may be not that active and they're willing to come down and watch a session. The reason it can't be a coach or a player is because during the session, if they if they're coaching or playing, um, it's very difficult to keep an eye on the on the bigger picture. So when we had social distancing in phase two, that in particular would have been difficult. So you're you're trying to keep an eye on everybody to make sure everybody's staying apart. Um, that will is obviously is gone now in the south. It still applies in the north, but um, if a coach is coaching, they can't keep an eye on other things that are going on. So 
um, if a group of players are, are waiting to come onto the pitch, that is the COVID officer's job to move them on or to make sure that they're social distancing. A coach can't do that if they're coaching. So while it is going to make life difficult for clubs, big and small, um, it's, an, it's, it's a, an unfortunate necessity. And if it's going to make our clubs safer and it's going to make your players safer and it's going to make sure that we don't have incidents then it's something that you just gonna, you're just you going to have to do and you're going to have to work around how it's going to be done. Um, but as I said, you can train up a parent, you can train up inactive members, you can bring in you know, someone that maybe uh, somebody's husband or somebody's wife that, that, uh, that just comes to watch matches and you just train them up with this course and you get them out there and they know what to look for. Um, as long as your, your head COVID officer, your CBO is, is well-trained, the COVID supervisors and the COVID supervisors know what they're looking out for, then you, you should be able to manage it. But we're not suggesting for one minute that this is going to be an easy task for any club to do, but it is something that we're going to have to do. Um, the next question, when the committee is notified of a player having developed symptoms either on the pitch or outside of the pitch, what is the next step for the committee? I'm assuming that it's just really just to, to be there to support the, the work of the COVID officer. Um, I don't really think there's anything else much that needs action. Uh, Viv and Phil, have you anything to add to that? I think once once a player has developed sim symptoms, I mean, the, 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 what we're doing is we're asking them to contact their GP. At that stage, if, if, if anybody, player, coach, anybody, parent uh, is found to have COVID-19, at that stage, the HSE take over. They take over and they do all the contact tracing. So once it's they don't, there's nothing else needs to be done. So you don't need to report it to anybody. Um, you just need to ask that person to contact their GP, and then then they take over. So there are no responsibilities on the committee to do anything further than that, except to make except for as I say to support the COVID officer and to keep an, a a note of people who are in isolation or who have reported that they've got. So at least then you know when they when they want to come back, you're going to be looking for you know something from their GP to say that it's safe for them to come back. So other than that, there are, there are no other responsibilities. Yeah, okay, and the next question, is the health questionnaire to be completed prior to every training session or just the first session? Well, it's really up to the club, but our, our current advice is that it's that declaration that if you do develop symptom, that they will not come to training or, or let us know. So um, I think we've covered that earlier. That's Claire helpfully putting up her her uh, where you send the form to. Um, so someone's asking, are we suggesting that we should be asking all players to do the online course and confirm they have done so? We're just advising, I think, Phil and Viv, that that is a good way to communicate it. I think it's important as well that you communicate it as a COVID officer within your club as well. And that's probably more important. Mm -hmm. Can you confirm information about the health question? Right, okay, so I've covered that off as well. Hopefully, Leanne, um, hopefully covered off your question. We do not own our pitch facilities that we use for training. How can we ensure that the owners of the pitch put the necessary changes in place? Bill, do you want to take that one? Apologies, I was replying in private to another message. I missed the question. <laughs> Tricked you there, Phil. Got caught you out. Um, we we right, don't. Can I just, own... Sorry, Sue. Can I just say some of you are sending us questions directly in private, um, and they're not coming up for us all to read. So I've got two people have sent me sent me questions directly. Um, so I I will answer those, and that's what I was doing, uh, which is fine. Uh, but just if you are asking a question, if you can click it for everybody, that would be great. So sorry. Go ahead, Sue. So, so for anybody who doesn't own their facilities, you know, do you, is the responsibility on the facility provider or is the responsibility on the club or is it a bit of a mix and communication there that needs to happen, Phil? Ultimately, the club is responsible for its members. So it's your responsibility as a club to ensure that the pitch and the facilities are safe to return to. 
uh, and then depending on your agreement with the uh, the owners of the field uh, or the owners of the facility, it's up to you to negotiate that to make sure that things are put in place or are they going to allow you to put those things in place. So it's very much dependent on the relationship you have with the owner. So, if, for example, if you play in a community centre, I would suspect this would not, would not be an issue. If you play in a private grounds um, that you lease from a private company, you may have to ensure that um, they're happy for you to put everything in or that they will supply it. So again, it would be up to you to discuss that with the owners and then take it from there. So uh, just to fly through the rest of these because we're, we're <laughs> nearly uh, used our hour. Um, so uh, Sharon, you were asking who's giving the advice on, on the guard of betting, that is Sport Ireland and our, our contacts there. Um, if that advice changes, we will get back in touch with you, uh, the COVID officers, obviously. Um, was there an answer given a number eight, Ian? No, there wasn't, because I think we covered that off earlier. We do not recommend any kind of format for, for contact tracing. That is up to the club um, to, to, to decide on. Uh, can a COVID officer be a team manager? That is a good question. If the team manager um, doesn't have specific another specific role during a coaching session, yes, probably. But um, you know, again, this person does need to kind of sit back and oversee everything that's going on. So that just needs to be a consideration. Um, what is the latest that the COVID officer must be registered by, Daphne? Really, it's just before the club wants to start. Um, you, you cannot start your activities until that person is registered. And also until the declaration has come through to the branch. Yes. Okay. Uh, where we at? Right. Okay. Sorry, I'm just skimming the rest of these questions. Nice little questions here. Um, where is this? Um, Alison, um, we kind of covered this earlier. You might have missed it. So, visiting teams, um, we're, we're not really talking about visiting teams at the moment. We need to update protocol as the government guidelines come out and um, you know we'll, we'll be keeping in touch with the sport ni and sport ireland on that we don't have really much um much clarity on the whole competition aspect of this yet so we will provide that as we go um doo -doo -doo. Right, um, Brenda, is the CVO to be the officer for the entire club or can there be one for each section? Viv, do you want to answer that? Sorry, um, does it have to be? Sorry, I, I missed that. I was just reading another question. <laughs> I can answer it. Um, so the more the more COVID officers we have, the better. Yeah. So if you can get one for every section of your club, then that's advisable. Um, really, if we could get one for every single group in the club. So if you have six under twelve groups and you can get six CVOs, that's fantastic. Uh, we are realistic in the fact that we know clubs struggle to get coaches, never to mind CVOs. So you do what you can to get uh, to cover off as much as you can, but we're saying at least one, but you're going to need a lot more than that. And that's why you might have COVID supervisors um, as well as COVID officers. So again, you know, someone who's done a little bit of training and knows what to look out for can be your COVID supervisor. And then you keep your, your COVID officer keeps an eye on the whole thing. Um, there's, I'm just going to cover off maybe one or two more questions because I think, um, yeah, we've kind of covered as, as much as we can, and look, we can submit questions after this, as I say, to to the the info at hockey.ie. Um, Anne Murphy has said, if a club um has a player with known underlying condition who wants to play, what is the club's responsibility? Bill, do you want to take that one? Uh, well, the club's responsibility is to make sure that you're following the guidelines and the protocols and that you're making it as safe as possible. It's the player's decision as to whether they want to train or not, and they should seek medical advice before doing so. Um, it, it's You can only do so much. I mean, 
you know, we, we provide defibrillators in case someone has a heart issue. Um, we will make sure the clubs are as clean as possible and that everyone is following the protocol. And then if there's an incident, um, we will, we, you know, we, we'll have to investigate as to why that happened. But it's not the responsibility of the club to allow that player to train or not to train. You set up your training, you set up your, your protocol and your systems as, as best as you can. And then the player makes their own decision as to whether they can train or not. Johnny, you know, I get your question, your next question here about, you know, a requirement from the GP. I don't think we ever meant that you needed to get like a written requirement or whatever else from the GP. Again, it is the, per the player's personal decision to come back to training. But what we have to say as a club is, uh, is that OK with your GP or whatever else? Am I right in saying that, Phil? There's no, we, I don't think we ever said that there's a requirement there that a GP has to sign off for somebody to come back to hockey. Sorry, I might have actually said that they we, 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 we would want to know that the doctor is happy, but that's actually up to the person themselves to let us know that they are happy to return to training. We're not looking for a doctor's note. Um, I don't think there's going to be there's going to be that. Um, there's just one question there that from Sue that I'm just looking at. If we've two age levels training at the same time, we have a confirmed case, surely we have to cancel training for those two groups for two weeks in order for players to isolate. Again, this comes back to if you've got a confirmed case, then the doctor, the HSE and the NHS will take over and they will do go through the contact tracing and tell people who needs to isolate and who, who doesn't need to isolate. So it really is up to it, it is up to making sure that that information that you have is up to date and is ready for them if they come looking for it. Um, I'm just going to cover off one last question here. Um, does the, co the lead COVID officer have to attend every training session or can the COVID supervisor do this? So the COVID lead does not have to attend every training session. Your COVID supervisors can attend every training session and that's why we do advise that you have a, a panel big enough to, um, to cover off uh, you know, your, your club. Um, there's a and just above that. There's a question in from Shirley who says, I, "I'm a player and asked and was asked to be a COVID officer. Can this still stand?" Um, obviously, if you're playing, you can't be a COVID officer because you can't keep an eye on things. But it might be an idea for clubs to say, "Look, if this group are training from six to seven, could we train up one of that group?" to become the COVID officer for the seven to eight slot. Can we train someone up for the seven to eight slot to be the eight to nine slot or however, however you want to work it? So players can be uh, COVID-19 officers, of course, but just not for their own sessions. So that might be a way of getting your additional volunteers in place to make sure that uh, you're covered off. Okay, um, I'm going to close this off here. Um, you know, we might it might be beneficial to do this again. We will send um out a um a questionnaire after this, maybe tomorrow, um just to, to get some feedback as to whether this was helpful, whether it wasn't helpful, or what, what would be a good support for clubs. We do realise that um that this is a big ask for you guys to take on. But ultimately, you know, as we say, gradual return. And just make sure that you know you're you're happy that everything is being done safely and within your your limits in in your club. If you have any further questions, there's there's more coming through even as I talk. Um, can you please just email them to info at hockey.ie and um and we'll we'll go from there. But thank you so much everybody for your time and you know we really appreciate all the work that you volunteers are doing in this. And um, so yeah, just thank you from from all of us here. Thank and also, thank you. Maybe, maybe what we might do, Sue, is we might actually have a look at, at some FAQs and put them up on the website. Um, yep. So, some free, so, so let's have a look at those, and we can get some of the the ones the the the, the better questions, the ones that have been asked more regularly, and we'll get the answers to those up on the website. Yeah, and I will send on the presentation along with that feedback survey, and there will be this has been recorded, so it will be popped up um, as a as a as a information if you want if you so wish to to go back and look through it again. Um, but yes, thank you very much, everyone. Phil, have you anything to add? No, sorry. There's a, one of our our contributors is Johnny Cash, which is uh, amusing. Amusing. Thanks, Johnny. We appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.